Hey, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer. We expect you to take those opinions and form your own financial conclusions and make your own financial decisions. Today is Wednesday, January 19th, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. In this week's episode, I'm joined by fellow Blockhead Trader ViperXL007, and we are going to take a look at crypto this week. I have finally kind of taken time and, and gone through the episodes that we recorded on the introduction to crypto. I've kind of thought, hey, what, what caught my attention? What was I puzzled about? Remember, I'm kind of a, a, a noob when it comes to this stuff here. And so in this week, we're really going to take a real true beginner's Cliff Notes version of the crypto world. But before we hop to that topic, I want to give a shout out to our Discord, link in the description below. Click that, check out, say hello, uh, let us know what you're trading, let us know what you love to hear about. You also can find the thetagang.com forward slash sprocket888, where I post each and every trade that I make, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But let's get to this week's content. Viper, I've taken some time to go through a bunch of the crypto. I've even entered a couple of crypto plays just to kind of test the waters, move some money around and, and see how it goes. And so far, I'll say it's a it's a decent experience. I, I have some some complaints and some learning pains and, and, and stuff like that, but it's not bad. Here's the question I'm most curious on. Now that you've touched it and felt it around a little bit and at least not maybe maybe haven't, you know, like put money in all these different uh all of these different things, but you've seen them and learned more about them. So how much of where we're at today in crypto is either a surprise to you that in that it's a surprise we're already here or also just kind of a, aha, see, I knew this was where it was headed, you know, like, you know, just cause I know back in the day you had these big, <laughs> like this could do this, 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 like, is there anything that's a complete shock to you as well as a realization of what you envision? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. A lot of what is out there is actually a pretty close realization to some of the stuff that I, I thought was, was possible. Um, I'll say what surprises me is the difficulty in which it is to actually get started and understand things. Um, that, that was a little surprising that in 10 years, that hasn't gotten much better. I mean, it's a world designed by engineers. Uh, user experience is not on the list. <laughs> it is, but but there are many things in this world. Uh, you know, look at Apple products. Um, there are things where user interfaces and things can be can be done. I much would nicer, say we're so. at the crypto is at the Linux stage, and we haven't progressed to the Apple stage. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So. I thought I would take a little bit of this episode and try to draw some analogies and walk you guys at the beginner through. I've tried to put myself in your shoes. And lucky for me, I, I'm kind of in your shoes a little bit because a lot of this stuff is so different and so new uh, from when I had visited it before. And, you know, you forget things, you don't stay in touch with things. And so this week it's all about trying to simplify this down to the point where things should kind of start to make sense. We're going to draw parallels to things in this world that that you know about, you understand. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably going to miss a couple of technical details, but we're doing that on purpose because I want to get across the main ideas and the themes to help, under, to help you understand how the world is laid out in crypto. Let's take a look here. The first thing I want to talk about is what does the world of crypto look like? And I've been in here, I've moved some things around, and I want to basically say to you guys, it's very similar to the worlds that you're used to. You know, the world where you go to Target and you spend money and you purchase goods, uh, you go to Kroger, you buy groceries, you put money in a bank account. Uh, all the same concepts are going to exist in the crypto world. It's like a parallel universe. And 
you could think of the, the three main elements that really exist there are currency, and those come in the form of coins and tokens. And so you'll hear things like, oh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. All of these things are coins and tokens, and they represent currency, the things you use to purchase goods, to purchase services. The other element in there is NFTs. That stands for non-fungible tokens, and an NFT is just a unique object. So it is an object that could be uh, something you purchased uh, to, to admire as a piece of art. It could be a functional widget that you purchased to do an action, things like that. But it's basically things you can buy with your currency. And then the very last element of the crypto world that is important is the ledgers. Okay. The ledgers are basically what move uh, and record the actions that take place in the crypto world. And that's referred to as the blockchains. So blockchains is merely a ledger that records transactions of transfer of coins, the transfer of goods or services, and it writes them down in a public record in a public way so that everyone knows that this particular transaction took place. You'll hear a lot of other concepts around crypto. You know, we even talked about them in the previous episode, dApps, DAOs, smart contracts. All these are more complex products that are constructed out of these basic building blocks. So in, in these things, they essentially boil down to transactions on the blockchain, transfer of currency, coins and uh, tokens, or transfer of objects of NFTs. The last point that I want to kind of touch on here, and we'll get to this, is when you move goods and services around, there is a specific container that everything has to fit in. There, and each one of those is what's known as a block. And you can think of this like the USPS boxes that's a flat rate shipping, that you pay one price. If it fits in the box, it ships for that price. If you need more than one box, it's going to cost you more money. If you can ride share and put a bunch of things in that box, then everybody can share the cost of that one box to a lesser amount of, of the cost of that. Yeah, two uh, additional analogies that just came to mind while we were, while we were going through this slide. Um, if they mean anything to you, let them sink in and think about it. If they don't mean anything to you, drop it and move on. But... Uh, obviously, metaverse is a word that's just all over the place right now. And to me, uh, uh, something that I just saw today in a Discord group, like somebody was like, think of metaverse beyond beyond just one application, like, you know, one game that you log into and, oh, this is the metaverse. Like metaverse as a digital world that encapsulates everything we just talked about. Metaverse as the internet plus currency and economies and things happening inside, um, <clears throat> which then led to my second an uh, analogy, which is the movie Ralph breaks the internet. Uh, you know, I mean, he, uh, hops on this little train in the, in the station goes into the router and then he gets shot into the internet and he's in this little capsule and then just play through that movie. If you've seen it and the way they represent the digital world in that movie Maybe it's helpful to some of you like me, maybe not to some others, but just picture a lot of things, moving parts in that world, in that movie kind of can relate to some of this as far as NFTs, objects and things like that. But uh, those are just two examples <laughs> that at least came to my type of mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty cool scene. Uh, how Ralph kind of moves around in there. Let's talk about entering the world of crypto. You say, boy, I, I want to get in this world of crypto. I want to move money around. I want to purchase some of these goods or services. Where do you start? Because there's there's so many. You you hear of MEXC, Coinbase, Crypto.com. There, there's all this stuff. What What is all this? And that brings us to how do you navigate? And the best analogy, I'm going to stick with these uh Blockchains are the rails of the crypto world. They're how you move goods and services. They they run the trains that move from one point to another. And when you want to go somewhere in a large city, 
Uh, you'll probably get in a subway system or a train system. And when you want to enter that, you're going to go into a particular station. And different stations have different destinations, different capabilities. Uh, some of them have multiple tracks that come through there. In New York City, uh, you have Grand Central Station, and you've got multiple lines that run through there, the green line, the purple line. Uh, Washington, D.C., Metro, you have stations which will bring the red line, the orange line, the gray line, the blue line. And think of every station as essentially a crypto exchange. So some exchanges have lots of products, lots of ticket options. Some crypto exchanges will have lots of rail choices where you can come in one particular blockchain and then leave on another blockchain. And this is really where you'll enter the world at. These are where you can take your U.S. dollars. You can walk in to an exchange, hand over your U.S. dollars, and purchase from the market that they're creating uh, You know your, your coins or your tokens. And then when you want to take them somewhere, where do those rails go that leave that station? So if you know that you want to get to... Uh, you know, downtown uh, Manhattan, you know you're going to want to take one of those particular uh, colored lines to get to where you want to go. So you might want to start at the station that has that ability to onboard you and put you on the right rail. Otherwise, if your final destination isn't from your station, you're going to have to travel to another station and from that station make a transfer to a different line and take another station. And you really have to think about this and, and think about every stop in the crypto world is a train station. And blockchains are limited to its particular network. So you can't, it's not like a multi-use road where you can run semis and compact cars and, uh, you know, sedans. It's a train rail. You only one train can run on it, and it only goes to its particular stops. It can't stop randomly uh, at at different locations. It can't drive off the road. And the one thing that you're also going to need when you get into this is you're going to need to take your money with you. And that's really where these wallets come in. And the wallet is is just an object that can hold your transactions, your records, so that people know you have. X currency in your wallet, you own X objects, and then you can take that with you as you go uh, to different destinations. And one point on the wallet situation is, again, building on these these color lines, red line, green line, et cetera, you have a card for that line. Um, so you have a green card and a yellow card and a red card. Um, and those colored cards only keep track of what you do on that particular train. So in this case, something like MetaMask is a universal wallet where you it's a folio that you slide each of these cards into. Um, so that way you can open up MetaMask in this case as your wallet and pull out which card you need for which line you're about to get on. Um, and that's the only reason I call that out is because there's each line has its own wallet MetaMask brings it all together as your folio that you can just pull out, pop the card you need, and get on the tra train. That's actually a great analogy because you can buy, you know, certain punches and things like that to to various bus routes or train routes and things like that. So the the other thing I'm going to mention here is when you go to onboard at these stations, they all pretty much do a process that they call KYC. It stands for know your customer. I bring this up because I'm not a big fan of, of turning over a lot of personal documents, personal information to random companies on the internet. And to be honest, some of these stations that you're going to get into, these exchanges, they're not, they're, they're a little shady looking. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, they're, they're the parts of the internet that your mother <laughs> warned you about. Uh, they're, they're fine. Many of them are fine. I'm just saying they don't, they don't give the appearance of, you know, google.com. Uh, they can look a little bit strange and it's, it's a little unnerving to basically want to participate at that station. And you have to turn over the photo of your driver's license front and back. You have to turn in, uh, your bank account information. So there's, there's a lot of personal information that these things are going to collect that's part of, I'm going to say it's part of regulation or an unknown regulation. 
So there's not a lot of governance over crypto and where there is, and it varies by region. And because these things want to operate everywhere, they have to know the customer they're dealing with, what region are they from, what laws apply. And the only way for them to do that is to kind of gather this validated info. So just be cautious of this. Know that it's out there when you see it. I mean, it, it's something the, you're going to have to face. The, uh, the worst one that I did, and this, this is also why on previous episodes, like I try, I, this is why I said I try to keep something like Coinbase as my on-ramp vehicle. There's a lot of downsides to that, but that, you know, I mean, as far as these corporations go, that's at least one that's very heavily regulated within the government and all this kind of stuff. Doesn't, I mean, doesn't mean anything about the data they collect on me and how well they'll keep it. But I try to keep my known uh, vulnerability points uh, limited. But the one that g just gave me the, I don't know, the heebie-jeebies of, of like, what is this? Is one of the KYC processes was, here's a six-digit code, write it on a piece of paper and hold it next to your face and take a picture. <laughs> like, just to prove that it was me. I was like, is this like... If I go missing someday, like this is going to be the picture they put on the news. It's just me staring at the screen. <laughs> Man KYCs. <laughs> six, six, seven, four, two. Man KYCs and goes missing in crypto. But yeah, it, it's a weird, it, and I, that's, I, I hate doing them because yeah, a lot of these exchanges are born out of necessity of being the only shop in town for a particular niche. And so a couple of the exchanges that are well reputable exchanges are like website designs are pure copy ripoffs of each other. Like they just pass the same website design code around and say, now you go do your thing with it. And that, I don't like that feeling at all. That brings us to the next topic that I want to talk about. And that is getting around. There's no free passage. Now, I'm going to call this a very unfortunate situation that we're in in the crypto world. Uh, Viper just just mentioned it, where he's talking about, hey, look, you know, the, where I want to go, I wanted to go to this exchange, I wanted to do this. A lot of the exchanges try to be your all-inclusive resort. They want to have all the products that you want to trade. They want to have all the things you want to buy under one roof. They want to be that supermarket, um, that that mall, an indoor mall. But the fact of the matter is they're never going to be. And there's going to be places where you want to take your, your money, you want to take your stuff and purchase or exchange products somewhere else. You're going to need to get on the train. You're going to need to go somewhere else to buy whatever it is you're looking for, to trade whatever it is you're looking for. And, and this is where it gets very unfortunate because it costs money to move around. And in some cases, it costs a lot of money to move around. And so there's really no, you know, oh, it's going to be this much round trip to fly to Las Vegas or to take the train to Uptown. Um, it really depends on what it is you're taking with you and what it is you're, you're trying to transact. And the best way that I kind of give an example of this is, like I said, I, I've done a few transactions, small transactions, nothing huge. Um, and I put two examples down here. This example here on the left uh, was a simple transfer of funds. I took a certain amount of ETH, which is Ethereum, and I moved it from one station to another station because I wanted to trade money over here and I needed to move my ETH from here to there. So drop dead simple transaction. It took what's known as 21,000 units of gas on the Ethereum network. And this is the gas price at the time. So you multiply these two things out, uh, then you factor in the cost of ETH at that time, and you will see that I paid $4.92 to make that transaction on that network. That is basically a rail fee to go from station one to station two. Didn't buy anything, I didn't get anything, I'm just in a different place. The transaction on the right was a little bit more of a complex transaction. And what I say by that, by that is I took my Ethereum and I staked it in a pool. And don't worry about all of that. I mean, you can go back to other episodes, listen to that. But essentially, 
I put my Ethereum in a loan bucket to earn interest while it's utilized by that pool. In return, that pool essentially gave me a receipt for my transaction in the form of a token. So this was what was known as more of a smart contract execution. They recorded my transfer of ETH to their pool. They logged information about my, my uh, currency in their pool, the how they're going to pay me out, all those things. And then they awarded me a receipt of a token. So lots of data are going into this transaction. And this transaction consumed 225,000 gas. So back to that, that methodology or that image I gave you on the first topic there of if it fits, it ships. The amount of lines of data that I needed to put on the train as cargo was much greater in this particular transaction. It cost a lot more because it took up a lot more space in that box. And you can see there's a bunch of other records here that go with it transaction. In the transaction on the left, it was just one simple record. So much ETH from this account to this account, done. This transfer had a whole lot more activity and therefore cost a whole lot more gas. And to reiterate kind of what we talked about on the previous episodes around this issue of gas fees and whatnot, the whole reason... These are a thing or because there's so many people, we'll call ETH the red line because red is the color of panic and I panic anytime I need to do anything on the Ethereum network. And so these are so high because <laughs> the red line is just crowded. There are just tons of people and the only way you can prioritize your place on the red line is to pay more money than the guy next to you to make sure you get on that train. Um, and so that's why these these price wars break out. Um, so what we see here of fifty three four five dollars. So let's call it let's round up to sixty dollars because I'm sure there was more involved. So what happens here for sixty dollars? Other trains. There's a green line that goes, you know, to the same place, but maybe through another couple of stops. But you can get there, uh, and you can do it all for fifty cents. Um, and that's where some of this calculus of what network do I want to be in on and doing things on. And for me personally, I'm I'm done with these gas fees. I, it didn't take long to be sick of them. And there's plenty of products on other train lines that I'm interested in, in my strategies. Uh, and so I'm much more happy to do this over there. So it's not like just getting into crypto, you're going to get hit with the $60 to move things around. You absolutely are if you're on the Ethereum, if you're on the red line. Um, but it, not all of them are this expensive, though they do all have gas fees for similar reasons. They're just not this high. Yeah, it's a great call out. Um, the The impact of the US dollars to, to your transactions will vary based on the network, but the truth is there's no free passage. There is no network that has no fees. You will pay gas fees everywhere going anywhere. Let's retie it all back together. So trying to keep this simple for you guys, trying to keep things real basic here. Crypto is just three building blocks, currency, ledgers, and objects. Currency, the money you have, the money that buys things. That's all this is. Every token you hear about, every uh, coin you hear about, it's all currency. Ledgers blockchains. This simply records the transactions in a way that makes them irreversible. So it's it's nothing more than if we had a book of paper that we opened up and said, Sprocket gives Viper $20. Let's do that. Viper gives Sprocket $5. I like this return. <laughs> That's it. That's all the ledger is. And you could write down simple transactions. You could write complex data on there, but it just, it all consumes paper. It all consumes ink. And, and once it's there, it's there. And the very last thing, and, and this could be the thing that trips up a lot of people like NFTs, okay? NFTs, non-fungible tokens, like that's a fancy name with a, an acronym. 
it's an object. It could be a piece of art. It could be uh, an, uh, something that serves a functional value in, in a video game. Um, it, it could be anything. You, you walk into Target and you see candy bars, you see toys, um, you find household utensils. All those things are objects that you buy with currency. Some of them are useful. Some of them you just look at. And that's all the objects are. Yeah. And when you're thinking of NFTs and objects, I mean, really let it sit in your in your thought process of, like I said, Rec uh, Ralph breaks the Internet, uh, buying something in that world they drew up. Um, a lot of people want to think NFTs are just digital art or, you know, that just happens to be the most uh, talked about in in the news cycle. Um, they are that. I mean, you know, continuing Ralph breaks the Internet like I mean, you could Ralph could go buy just a little piece of art. But let it sink in of, of an object and the, the target mentality of going into the store. Not everything in there is art. There are some art pieces that you could buy, but there are functional things. There are keys that do a certain thing to a cert to another thing. Like there's unique things that have function to you. That's why you're there shopping. Um, and so that's the very high level of NFTs is there's art, but there's also ways those objects are functional to do something. Uh, and that, makes up the broader scope of the object. Viper, this is really my take on where we are with crypto or where I am with crypto, trying to introduce it. Um, I've got a couple of, of plays that I want to do. I want to do an episode to, to actually walk our users through, our viewers through um, the process of, of making a trade, seeing it uh, in a video of, of moving the funds. Um, we're going to do that in the future. Hit subscribe so you get notified. One thing that I'll, I'll call out here is once I started wrapping my brain around these just simple currency, ledgers, networks, and objects, a lot of things start to make sense. And you can start to kind of frame. So when you hear of something new, some term you didn't see, think to yourself, is this a currency? Is this a blockchain? Is this an NFT? It's, it's going to be one of those things, or, or it's going to be a way that you mix those things together to create something. And, and I think that will really kind of help frame some of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, no joke. Since the very first time we talked about crypto, crypto strategies and all that kind of stuff, like the, the only way I've gotten to the understanding that I have as far as investment vehicles or, or whatever, um, is just a nonstop avalanche of information gathering. And, you know, it was, I mean, it's start with literally whatever the first question that pops to your mind is for me. One of the very first things I did was what the heck's the difference between a coin and a token? Um, that's a very high level thing. And I put that into the old Google machine and sure enough, I'm down a rabbit hole. And then going down that rabbit hole, new terms, new terminology, new ideas. Then blockchains <laughs> come up. Well, tokens on a blockchain. And then, like, why is it blockchain different? And just boom, 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 boom. Um, so to me, it's it's a very fun rabbit hole because there is just endless data and learning about the space, even if you're not even going to touch it, even if you just want to know what's happening here. Well, uh, because I do think this is a a fundamental moment we, who knows where it goes or how it ends, uh, but it's a major thing. And so just from a, an academia perspective, there's a ton of really cool information to learn uh, more on the investment side though. You don't, if you feel intimidated by hearing things like DAOs and decentralized exchanges and all these different strategies, just keep the high level analogies in your mind of grand central station, the resort, you could, if you, if you know crypto, if you think crypto, if you're convinced crypto is going to be a huge thing in the future and you just want to dip a tiny little bit of, you know, speculative cash investment into it, you can be 100% satisfied going from your bank to Coinbase, just picking from whatever products they have available and never touching the rest of the space. You go to the resort, it's all inclusive. It's a sandals resort for you. You're happy. And you can get your exposure that way. So don't feel like you have to go even deeper into the, off the, off the trail. 
Um, but that is, you know, like the analogy of, of, you know, sometimes you want to go on an excursion that is hosted by a local guide instead of the resort, but that's purely up to your own, uh, personality and your own objectives. But so don't think you have to go that deep. One thing that I will mention here, and we'll elaborate it in a future episode at some point. I mentioned when I trade equities and options to keep a trading journal, but holy smokes, <laughs> keep a trading journal yes. in crypto world. Keep a trading journal, record everything. What station did you go to? How did you get there? What did you transfer? Keeping track of your funds, where they are, how much gas fees did you spend? How many transaction fees did you spend is not an easy task. In, in fact, it's incredibly daunting. I'm I'm working on a spreadsheet. I'll share it with you guys when I have something worth sharing that is trying to track some of this, but you're not going to get a 1099B from all of these places to know what was my profit and loss? What was my gain? What was this? I, I, this is an uncharted territory, I think, when it comes to uh, taxes and things like that. I put those aside, forget about that. Okay, yeah, that's a thing. But you want to know, am I losing money? Am I making money? What's my return? And you have to keep track of all of this stuff and, and where everything went and record it all. And it will, it, it's definitely, I would say, one of the most disappointing aspects of the crypto world that there don't seem to be a lot of solutions for this problem. But I understand why. It's because everything is so decentralized. It's because everything is so disconnected that there's not a good record that is all encompassing of, oh, this money turned into this and then it went here and then it went here and then it went here. So this is all considered one investment. None of that exists. And it's up to you to basically track it. There are some things out there that track and maybe it's going to be good enough for you, but I would encourage you no matter what you have journal this just like we recommend in equities and options. And yeah, things like absolutely. That. And that's for, for the, the, uh, tax minded, you know, organization, uh, you know, keeping your tax information organized and whatnot. That's another argument for the sandals resort for the Coinbase, because Coinbase is going to give you, you know, standard, uh, tax reports and information, you know, at, when, the, when that time comes, um, <clears throat> and because once you step outside, once you go that local trail, it's on you and, you know, here we're obviously we do not encourage anything that's not by the books report what your gains and losses are send it to the government do your thing um but i think that's why the government struggles so much with cryptocurrency because they they don't know how to have a handle on tracking these gains and whatnot um and so that's a big challenge for them but um uh, everything by log i mean i have a pretty gnarly spreadsheet that's gnarly and it's a total jumbled mess but i know what it is but yeah i need much more organization but i log everything because i know when i get on those local trails uh, it's up to me to make sure that i'm doing everything by the books and you know not just like like sprocket said not just for the tax implications but because it really gets easy to lose track of what money is where and wait a second, I moved that over there, but I did I sell that for a profit before I went over there? Or was that a loss? And I was recovering, and da, da 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 Like, so there's been a number of occasions where even my hodgepodge spreadsheet has saved a ton of clarity and helped kept me on track with what I'm trying to do or what I'm trying to achieve. And no matter where you're trading, again, to reiterate, even in equities, it's 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 a perfect clarity reminder of what are you doing. And, and how did you get here? Uh, and just really helps keep you on track. So it's a great uh, thing to be doing regardless of where you're at. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. I hope you guys found this episode uh, informative to you, drawing parallels with the world that you might be familiar with. It helps really kind of link some of these more abstract concepts, these kind of strange terms to concrete things that you can relate to. 
Um, we're going to be doing more, a little bit more episodes for for new new beginners entering the crypto world because I'm going to continue to to journey into the pool, uh, wade in a little bit deeper. I'm also going to not give up my trading of equities or options, so stay tuned for that information as well. Good luck out there. It's been quite the volatile few days in the markets. Uh, everything hasn't been going the rosiest of roses, uh, but we haven't fallen through the bottom quite yet. But get out there, have fun trading, and remember, think outside the block.